Okay. Well, we are live. Thank you everyone for joining us this evening as a part of Festival Virtual this summer, our uh, virtual 2020 summer festival. We are on day 10 of 15 for virtual art, music, uh, theater, dance, and so much more. Um, my name is Maria Belcher. I am the executive director at Festival Charleston. And um, this year, or this, this evening, it is, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Melora Can, who will be presenting um, this evening as a part of OLLI, the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute. And uh, her topic this evening is uh, one that is very, very exciting. We're so thankful to have her, have her share her time with us. The Art of Venice's Carnivale and Italian Commedia dell'arte. Uh, so with that, I will uh, pass pass the, the virtual stage over to Mel. And Mel, you can, you can take it from here. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Maria. I'm glad to be here. Welcome to all of you who are able to share the time with me tonight. And as the opening screen that you see before you says, your next, <clears throat> excuse me, adventure begins here with Ali and Festival. And just for a quick word about OLLI itself, I, Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, we are developing our programs down here in Charleston. They've been around in Morgantown for a while now. And the focus is on providing educational opportunities for adults 50 and over with classes and events. And I've been an instructor with them for a while. We're going to deal with the art of Venice's Carnivale and Italian Commedia dell'arte tonight, which I think you'll find interesting. So welcome to Venice, Benvenuta a Venezia. And if you're a gentleman, Benvenuto. First, meet Venice, La Serenissima Repubblica di Venezia. And I have it located here on the map for those of you who aren't that familiar with Europe. Italy, as you probably know, is the long shoe shape hanging from the southern edge of Europe, but it is bordered by France, Switzerland, and Austria to the north and is surrounded by the sea. And Venice was born of the sea. And in aerial view, thank goodness for Google Maps, you're using them. There is a causeway right here that goes into the city of Venice. And what you see right here is the Grand Canal. And I have circled this point on it and then enlarged it and made it larger still. This is the Piazza di San Marco or St. Mark's Square facing the end of the Grand Canal where it opens up into the basin of San Marco. Learn to do this, right? Okay, one more time, there we go. Now you're looking at that same square, but from much closer to it. This is the Doge's, the Doge who is the leader of the government and the church. And this area here is the main piazza with a side courtyard. This is the Biblioteca di San Silvino, uh, the big national, library and it opens out here and these are all the gondolas that I'm sure you've heard of and over here down in the corner is the Bridge of Sighs and we'll talk about that more but I thought you'd like to know its location and try and remember that as we go along. This is the same piazza right here in this location that we just saw. And you're looking at it during a prior Carnivale. As you can see, it is a mass of people. Carnivale is a very special time in Venice and has been for over a thousand years. Had an interruption, but it has redeveloped in modern times. Except this year, it was a little different. This year we had COVID-19 and we're all aware of what that meant. And in the case of Venice, which had already begun Carnivale celebrations, they had to cut it short by a couple of days. 
rather than well, to Shrove Tuesday because of a shutdown by the government. But before it was, people were photographed in their costumes, complete with now a breathing mask. And when you go to Venice, if you have never been, not all the areas are wide open. Many of the back alleys or small canals are very narrow and with smaller bridges that pedestrians can cross over the water traffic. But even here, the visitors, as you can see, are masked for this year. So, Carnivale in Venice is a big celebration. And if you're not familiar with the Christian calendar, uh, Carnivale is the last day before 40 days of Lent. And the 40 days of Lent are a time of reflection and preparation for the big Holy Week and Easter. And prior to that last day, Shrove Tuesday, which goes by other names, they like to celebrate everywhere, Christians, some more than others. Here in America, I think it's even called Pancake Tuesday. But in Venice, Viva Carnavale, it's very special for a lot longer than just a single day. However, the keynote day is Shrove Tuesday or Fat Tuesday or sometimes Mardi Gras in French. And it can start earlier than it often does here in America. And in Venice, it has been known to start as early as October, but more traditionally usually starts right after Christmas. And the carnival celebrations go on the most explosive time, of course, is that final week prior to the beginning of Lent. So as it shows here, what you'll get used to me, I don't read the screens. Some people will find the information that I have put on the screen more useful than what I say. And since I can't see any of you, I'm just hoping you're either hearing me or reading that and getting the information you need. You're going to see a lot of photographs modern Carnivale, but not just modern Carnivale because as I said, it's been around for a long time, as has Venice. Venice actually officially began around 421. And it was at the conclusion of the Roman Empire when things were falling apart with the invasions of various tribal groups from Northern Europe. And a lot of Romans fled into the countryside and those that had set up seaports along the coast moved into the marshes and swamps and band hide there to establish themselves. Sorry, you're gonna get a little. As you can see, dogs play a big part in the paintings. And in the case of this presentation, you get a live background as well. At any rate, uh, this is a painting from about the 14, 1500s in Venice. Sometimes I can give you the name of an artist, other times not. There were a lot of visiting artists from the Netherlands Benelux area who came down because this was the time of the Renaissance to study, observed, and they were very meticulous in painting their observations. So what you're seeing here are observations of a typical Carnivale explosion of celebration for the final day before Lent. And they're eating lots of meat, fatty foods, and gorging themselves and having celebrations. And some of them, as we'll see in later pictures, are masked. So last Sunday before Carnivale, Dominica Carnivale, farewell to me Sunday. Ali in Italian, Carnival in English. And remember I mentioned the Bridge of Sighs. Here it is from uh, street level. And you're walking on it, still another bridge in front of it here to look down this canal. This side over here on the left is the Ducal Palace, which is where the Doge, D-O-G-E, the leader of the Venetian government would be. And on the right side, notice the bars on the windows and on the door is a prison. But I've put another couple of photographs on this particular slide because I thought some of you would recognize 
this overpass on Dickinson Street in Charleston, West Virginia. The first time I drove into your city, our, my city as well now, I, I saw this coming down over the South Side Bridge. I was stunned. I thought, why? That's the Bridge of Size. And in fact, it isn't when we can compare the two. But it immediately made me for architecture and just the fact that it was a passageway above a busy thoroughfare. In this case, our case, asphalt and there's water. So Viva Carnavale, starting as early as the end of October, right through to show Shrove Tuesday. This is right at the end, by the way, of the Piazzetta di San Marco where you're looking out over the big basin and you can see the gondolas right here, waiting for passengers. So both the Carnival of Venice and Commedia dell'arte, which is an Italian form of performance art, have been around for hundreds of years. The Carnival has been around probably at least 700 years that we can document for Venice. Uh, Commedia dell'arte for about 500 years, both of which precede us here in America by quite a bit. The tradition of the start of the city of Venice is interesting. They have their own folklore of how it started. There is no precise information because basically it was refugees from the invasions fleeing for safety to the islands. Already there had been a lot of people living along the edge of the water and many boats and fishermen and um, freighters and other kinds of trading activities going on. So it wasn't a big stretch to hop on some boats and push off into the reeds and weeds and find some form of island upon which to start a home. But to get to this point took a while. The legend, however, says that the bishop, the local bishop received a vision that he was to follow the birds. He was to follow the birds and they would lead him to a new place to found a great city. And so he led a great procession with all these refugees behind him out into the marshes looking for seabirds in a group and when he saw them diving down to one location, that became the center of the city of what would become Venezia or Venice in English. Nice, probably not true, but nice. So earliest documentation that has been discovered regarding Carnivale in Venezia, in Venice, is a document signed by one of the doge, Vitale Faliero, in 1094, just think about that for a minute, the year 1094. And he talked about it as a public amusement, which tells us that already it had quite a following and it wasn't an sell among other people. Now, Venice formed its own government and like many of the small Italian city-states, it was his own law and the city-state was a republic, kind of, with their own senate and leadership rather than having a king per se. So the doge was not a king. He was an elected leader, elected among the senate. Although sometimes it kind of went with an inheritance as well. So in this, this is a painting, if you're not, I'm not sure how clear this is to you, but this is a painting from the, 15, 1600s, you can see folks in costume and some of them you'll begin to recognize the traditional garb of the early Carnival celebrators as we go along. Right now, I'll just point out these little black capelets on the back shoulders of several gentlemen wearing black tricorn hats. You're going to see more and more of those as we go through the observations of the early celebrations of Carnivale. And here, this one painting, I believe, is from uh, someone from Flanders, a Flemish painter, observing Carnivale, probably in about 
oh, late 1500s. And you'll notice certain characters. This character down here in the white outfit with the cone-shaped hat. The fellow next to him in the tri-corner hat with black mask. This fellow down here with the stripes of orange and a dark color with a hat with big feathery plume in it. That's Il Capitano. We'll talk more about um, Pulcinello, who is the predecessor for the Punch and Judy shows, if you've heard of those from England. And then you've got other characters in different costumes. And here's another Pulcinello over here. They are performing on carts as they go through the city streets. And although Car uh, Venice has uh, lots of water, they do also have stone piazzas and narrow stone alleyways in between buildings, although a lot of bridges to get over the main canals. So early, this is probably even earlier than the 1400s. This may be as early as 1300s, this particular etching. And we have Carnivali in Venice, six weeks at least from Christmas on. And the celebrations, let's see if I can move myself up a little bit. The celebrations here can be quite exotic and very full of energy. This painting is showing you the extent of the lush finale of Carnivale. Take a look at the gentle man and woman seated on his cart being pulled by an ox. This fellow is in a Harlequin outfit, one of the Commedia dell'arte costumes. Here's another one. This one is in the Venetian um, pantalone outfit. And then here we have another pantalone who's pouring his wine down into the mouth of the gentleman. And notice the lady has a full round black mask. We'll talk more about that type of mask in a little while. One of the special aspects of Carnivale in Venice was everyone wore masks. Some of them wore dominoes, the half masks. Some wore these volto, which are kind of three quarters and others wore full face masks. This is a, a modern depiction of that period. And a lot of different artists have recorded these celebrations. And we're gonna look at some of their work, starting with Giacomo Franco from, he was born in 1550 and died in 1620. And if that number rings any bells with you from your grade school experience in history, 1620 was the year the pilgrims came to America. So that was the same year he passed on. He'd been around, so these costumes were from a period probably a bit prior to the pilgrims. But the ladies of Venice, especially the aristocrats, had certain styles that they hid beneath their robes and they liked to be taller. So we've heard of platform shoes. These are indeed extreme. And notice the hairstyle with the two horned caps of hair. You'll see that style of kings from the period. Here are also by Franco some etchings. Now this is remembered from the very early 1600s or the late 1500s. And I found this interesting as I didn't see it in later paintings. He put mustaches on the bottom of the masks, the domino masks. So even the women have little mustaches on their faces and sometimes a veil attached to the base of it. Here you have it from people, wine flasks going, they're celebrating. Sometimes they're doing things they probably shouldn't do. And this looks like a scene from one of the comedias. This is looking towards the main Duomo of St. Mark's. There's the bell tower. This is the one we saw as an aerial view early on. And this painting is by a gentleman, an artist known as Canaletto, but that was his nickname. His real name was Giovanni Antonio Canal. And adding Etto to the end is an Italian affectation simply meaning he was either small, 
one of those three, and I'm not sure which, quite honestly, but look at his dates. He is like the next generation twice, maybe, from what we saw with Franco. So the painting is much more sophisticated at this point. And this is actually post-Renaissance, because the Renaissance had wound down by then. We're into the Mannerist and Rococo period at this point. What I find fascinating is how exquisitely detailed his paintings were. Notice the shade awnings hanging down and down at the bottom in the piazza where people could go beneath them and little kiosks along the front of the cathedral. The gatherings of folks and over in this area, we're gonna visit a cafe that's located right about here towards the very end of this presentation called Florian's. If you've been to Venice, that name probably means something to you. This is also by Canaletto. He did not focus particularly on Carnivale, but since he does represent such things of life there, I wanted to end, is about the marriage of the city of Venice with the sea which takes place on Ascension Day, which is 40 days after Easter. So we've got Carnivale before Easter by 40 days or so, and the Ascension Day 40 days after. And this great big golden ship you see there is called Birchintoro, Birchintoro, sorry. And it is the ship or boat, depending on your attitude, I guess, belonging to the doge and he would go out on that during the celebrations on that day to drop a very valuable ring into the canal the grand or the basin large by basin i mean a large body of water at the end of grand canal which comes out right over here uh, to signify that venice owed her allegiance not to land but to the sea and since it gives you a sense of what life was like back then, I did want to include it. So Gardi is the first of two artists who really spent a lot of time doing genre paintings. Genre means uh, local life, reflection of what was actually happening around them, but adding in the element of Carnivale. And as we look at his paintings, you will see lots of Carnivale outfits from the initial, from not the initial, from the first set of celebrations, almost 700 years worth in Venice. Because what you see today, if you visit during Carnivale, is been reinstituted modern, modern aspect. But this was an outgrowth of centuries and centuries of celebration. And he had a fascination with the aristocracy, the wealthier classes. And so that's what he's depicting in their Carnivale outfits. Remember I pointed out a woman in a round black mask. Here's one, two, three, four more women in those masks. And we're gonna talk about that style. Then we have the tricorn hat with the black shoulder piece and the white mask, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, just 10 maybe, just in this painting alone. In addition, we have some of the tall white caps and white costumes. Do I see another type of costume? Not at the moment. This is a gaming parlor. Uh, like you might go to Monte Carlo to gamble. And this is a close up of that. You can see them here exchanging monies. This would be a back gaming room. And then there'd be a social aspect where they would kind of hang out together. And here you get a better look at those masks the women are wearing. And sometimes the women also wore this black tricorn hat with the veil, the white mask, and a second mantle covering their costumes. So you'll see them in different aspects. This is a different scene. This may have been a sketch, a simple oil sketch for later paintings by Gardy called the Gaming Hall. And these are huge rooms. If you visit 
any of the Palazzi in Venice, you will see rooms that are just mammoth like this within the buildings. Now, Pietro Longhi, the second painter who also focused largely on Carnivale and genre paintings, notice his dates. He died just about the time of the French Revolution, right after the American Revolution. So if that helps you to place it in time and space. These are portraits of him or by him. And this is his style of painting. And we'll get a chance to look a little more closely here. You can see he likes to put a couple of people in this particular Carnivale outfit up front. Usually it's a couple, a man and a woman. And they'll be posed and at least half of the people in this painting will be in masks. Here's one of the women in the black circular mask. This gentleman is not masked and here we have someone selling perfume. He also loved putting little dogs in his work. So here are two more. This is the charlatan, uh, a faker who's selling some kind of mixture He's got a little puppet show going on in the background, complete with a masked character. This woman has taken her mask off and is holding it. I love these little details when you look a little more closely at them. He's got a very vigorous brushstroke to his paintings, too, a very lively look to them. And most of the time, you get a sense that they are indoors or at least underneath the arcades, which is typical for life. Uh, in Venice and in other areas in Italy. In this case, the perfume seller, who we saw a close up of this picture before. Here we have one just called the elegant couple, and it looks like someone is begging here, or maybe purchasing some kind of product. And you have a gypsy in the background, another uh, figure with the tricorn hat, the masked couple, and uh, Quite often the gentleman seems ready to um, engage in some activity. You'll see little snippets of that sort of thing as well. Here the fortune teller reading a palm. Once again, the masks are in sight. And this is probably one of his most famous paintings simply because of its oddity. This is showing Clara the Rhinoceros who actually was documented as visiting Venice as part of a circus show. And it looks sadly as if the trainer has her horn, has removed it. And he's got some kind of a whip there, I guess, to make her perform in some manner. And here you have the curious aristocrats hanging over the edge to observe in their Carnivale outfits. And one more lady in the back and the second one is holding her mask. You can see that sliver of black. Over here, we saw the charlatan. Now this one's called the quack doctor. Apparently there were a lot of people back then trying to scam people just like, unfortunately there are today. So once more, one of the black masks, several of the white ones, the tricorn hats. So these were the traditional costumes of Carnivale over the hundreds of years that it evolved in Venice. The gaming hall, once again, Longhi, Plenty of, by now you're familiar with the tricorn hat with white mask and mantle and with the ladies in the black circle mask. And it looks like this lady is taking hers off to engage in some activity with this gentleman. And here, I don't know if that's gaming going on. Or I don't think it's a child simply because they're in the gaming hall. It's more likely. And he is in a Harlequin outfit, which is from the Commedia dell'arte, but was quickly adopted for Carnivale. Giovanni Domenico Tiepolo. He was the son of the more famous Giovanni Battista Tiepolo, who painted great frescoes, wall frescoes, on the summer homes out in the countryside, uh, villas for the wealthy of Venice. And they had all of these villas or palazzi out in the countryside uh, on land away from the city of Venice. And they would go to them on barges 
on the river that were connected with canal to focus you on carnivale costumes, one of the round black masks and one of the punchinellas. There are some other masks in the painting as well. But this one also by Tiepolo is called Carnivale in Venezia and in fact shows a lot more crowded close together. And as we saw in that opening photograph of Carnival, modern Carnivale, that hasn't changed, which is one of the reasons they had to shut it down this year. He did a lot of sketches, preliminary works that are called cartoons, often in the sepia ink prior to making his full scale uh, paintings. This one is called The Burial of Punchinella and it's from about 1800. So it's uh, a little bit later period than the others we saw. So let the revelry commence for 700 years documented, we know that it did in Venice until the Republic of Venice fell to the French invaders led by Napoleon Bonaparte in 1797. He took over the city, made it part of his empire, and in the process quickly realized that Carnivale, which involved people running around ignoring law and wearing masks so no one could accuse them of what they'd done, had to stop. So he outlawed the masks and he stopped Carnivale in 1797. In 1979, later, the Venetians decided to start it back up in its sense of celebration, in its sense of masks, in its sense of the beauty of the city and giving tourists, visitors, an opportunity to enjoy and partake. So they did, they started it up and it quickly became an exciting and tourist drawing event and has been since 1979. So that's like 40 years now in the modern era that Carnivale has returned to Venezia. So we go from costumes like this from the late 1400s or 1500s to 500 years later, let's say, costumes like this, because they didn't simply return to traditional ones, although some did, but added artistic flair of their own. So just as in all these different time periods, people wear the masks and become anonymous. And if you go to Venice during Carnivale and get a mask, you can also even rent a costume there. You don't have to buy one or bring one with you. You can wander around silently and no one's gonna know you're not a local. So you go from things like this, the traditional masks that we've seen, the circle ones for the women, round ones, and all the white ones, half three quarter mask for the women and the men with the black tricorn hats and the little capelets or fancy costumes to this. So we're gonna look at a few of the masks that are worn today that evolved or reflected the earlier Carnivale. This one is called the Bauta. And it doesn't mean just the mask. It also refers to the hat, the veil that often completely engulfs the edges of the mask and the mantle, which is worn on the shoulders and goes at least partway down the costume. So tricorn hat, mask, veil, and tabaro, which was the mantle. And you can see the tabaro here. You can see it on the shoulders of this gentleman here. And the colors have changed over time, but predominantly it's black and the mask is white. And why does it have this peculiar shape? Because you could keep the mask on and have a drink. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, how do I tip a glass under there? Try and think back to the painting I showed you where they were drinking wine from wine skins or flasks 
I kind of think of a bottle that you can tip up underneath the mask. And that's why this traditional shape evolved. Today, it might look a little different than it did back then, but still it reflects the original traditional style of Carnivale mask for Venice called the Volto. Volto is simply Italian for face or sometimes larva, which means because it, it looks like a ghost. And when you see these folks, whether in a painting from the past or a photograph of one maybe last year or this year even, you see what I mean about anonymity. Nope. And here we come to the round one that I kept pointing out to you. We saw the ladies wearing them sometimes in rather astounding fashion. And it's called Moretta, La Moretta. It's a velvet mask and it has no strings, nothing to connect, instead a single button that the woman had to clench in her teeth to hold the mask in position. Now that meant she couldn't talk. And if she couldn't talk, she was silent or mute. So it was also called servetta muta, or the silent mask. Uh, men probably liked that a lot. I'm not sure the women did too much, but as we saw in the observant paintings we've already seen, the ladies had no problem with removing it if they had something they wanted to say. So here are some glimpses of La Moretta from various pieces of artwork over the centuries showing it as a traditional Carnivale mask. This one I find fascinating, especially this year. Medico della Peste, or the plague doctor. There are several doctors with different types of costumes involved in Carnivale and Commedia dell'arte. And this particular mask and the figure it represents actually didn't come out of either Carnivale or Commedia dell'arte. Instead, it was a scientific invention by a French physician, Charles Delorme, who decided he needed something to protect himself from the Black Plague that he was treating. The reasoning back then was that it was an airborne disease, maybe brought just bad air, maybe breathed out. Considering what we're facing today, that's not such a out and left field kind of guess, actually, is it? But in Venice itself, they had several outbreaks of it. And the doctors, the dottori, might very well be wearing something like this to protect themselves. Now, as I noted down here, and I put this on the screen on purpose, they had one in 1630. I remember 1620s when the pilgrims reached America. Uh, in 1630, out of 140,000 people that lived in Venice, they lost 46,000. That's one in every three people. One third of their population gone. It's really rather um, breathtaking when you think about it. This is a modern version of the Torre de Peste the plague doctor costume for Carnivale. It's almost always this heavy black robe that goes down to the floor, black gloves, cane optional. A white ruffled neck piece is often associated with it. The mask itself is usually painted white with this strange kind of depiction on the side to indicate a bird's beak. And then spectacles. The original masks, when worn by actual doctors, they covered their eyes with pieces of glass inset into the mask. And so it resembled the fact they were wearing glasses. Now, when they were used by actual doctors 500 years ago, they would fill this section with various um, herbs, things that would have a good smell or at least a strong smell so that they wouldn't be smelling death and the dying when they were visiting. And it was kind of like a primitive gas mask or respirator at the time. And when you think that this was 500 years ago, that kind of impressive. 
But today you could see them in both the long robes were shorter ones. See, here he is with someone in the Bauta outfit. And they're, these days have been elaborated with much more replete decorations of all, but their traditional one still maintains a presence. Some, I, this almost makes him look a little angry with that uh, extra eyebrow piece on the glasses. But you have these fellows strolling down the narrow streets, making for perfect photo ops. And that's one of the things, uh, Il Bauta and Torre de Peste shown here, that uh, when I would attend one, the time to go was not in the evening when the festival was in full vigor, but earlier in the day, daylight hours, you would find the locals or the ones who wanted to celebrate Carnivale in their outfits, walking through the piazzas, standing, posing in groups for the photographers. It was photography heaven. And the costumes contrasted with the architecture made perfect photo ops. So how are the masks made? Notice how precise this mask, the true Venetian masks are, even today. And they've been made from all sorts of things. Note, you may remember I mentioned the velvet was used for the Moretta mask. Uh, the uh, Volto or Larva mask was probably a paper mache mask, although some were done in leather or waxed cloth. But to start out, to, to make a traditional Carnivale mask, such as was worn hundreds of years ago, today's mask makers, and these, this is a very talented artisan group, usually work in paper mache, but they don't work from scratch. First, they make a mold for the paper mache. And to make it all starts with clay. They don't use whole plasticine, which is kind of a greasy clay that sculptures often use to block out a figure because it doesn't harden, or it does, but very, very slowly over months, not quickly like potter's clay would. So using the clay, shaping it into a form, and if you look here, you can already begin to see the eyes and a short beak. Perhaps this is going to be one of the pest doctors. And in this one, you can almost recognize the shape of a Bauta costume mask here. And here we have one of the more Pierrot type masks, this kind of a face here, being shaped out of the clay, refined beautifully. These people are really talented. And once they have it finished and ready with a guard around the edges of it, they pour plaster over it. First, they, they grease it up with Vaseline or something uh, so that the plaster will later be easier to separate from the clay. They pack that plaster heavily onto it. If you've ever worked with the um, plaster or gesso, you know, depending on how you supersaturate the water with the plaster powder, it can set up very quickly in a matter of minutes. So working with it, getting it to a thick layer over the entire surface of the plasticine mask, you then let it harden. And once it's hardened, you pull the clay out of the mold. Here we see another instance of them pouring it on, but here you've got the mold with the clay ripped free from it. So it's in reverse now. And you can see the eye holes are actually protrusions where the nose, instead of sticking out, is hole going in. And that's what will be used to make the mask. And here we see what happens next in a whole series that I found. It's a wonderful set. You start by brushing the Vaseline on the inside of the mold. Then you use, now they said recycled paper. It could be anything, it could be old newspapers. More porous paper is better, something that absorbs. Paper toweling, not so much, that's almost too porous, but a firmish paper in layers, shredded maybe. Uh, in between the layers, it might be a simple 
mixture of flour and water, or it might be more complex. I found it interesting that they mention using wood glue. And I have worked with wood glue and boy, once that's hard, that is hard. I noticed too that they mentioned folding the edges. Not only does that strengthen the edges, but it helps shape the outline of the mask. And once it is complete, it's dried and will be popped free from the mask mold because the Vaseline prevents it from sticking. Here, the masks have been removed from their molds. And in this case, it's already being sanded slightly. Here you can see an application again. I like to use dark paper, it's easier to see that here. And once it's completely in place and they've left open, they didn't cover over where the eye holes will be to save themselves time, they pull it out. Here you can see them just scraping the eye holes a little bit, getting rid of any extra little filaments that may be left from the paper, shaping it well, and then once it's dry and in good shape, it's completely covered. Once that's dry, it's a blank canvas and can be left white like the Bauta mask is, or it can be decorated. And these days the decorations seem to be endless in variety. Using a variety of paints and brushes, they might cover one over completely in one color and then use a second color to create the chiaroscuro, the light and the dark, the shade and the shaping to better outline and emphasize the form. Sometimes they add things like little bits of lace glued on for a textural approach, uh, add metallic paints, vary the tonality so that it shines and it pops. And the end products can be really very elegant and beautiful. Here we have someone working in leather. I'm not as familiar, I'm sorry to say, with the process. I was able to find a few. I outlined this so you could see where the leather is caught on with nails onto a form to hold it, stretch it. I think they dampen it and then let it firm up and dry into the shape and finally stain them. Uh, they will become timeless, beautiful, and very expensive masks. Here he is working on it, one of the leather masks there. Almost like, uh, think of my almost like a shoemaker in some ways in terms of the crafting. At the same time, he's a sculptor and an artist. And here is standing, now that happens to be a Harlequino mask. And I know, and we'll talk about this later because of the cat-shaped eyes, the three quarter face and the great big bulb thing on the brow. They often have this bump up there. It, it probably it's back in the veils of time what it was for. So enter Commedia dell'arte. I've referred to it quite a few times, but now we talk about it because it became an inspiration for Carnivale masks. The original masks, the Bauta and the Moretta were added to with the arrival of Commedia dell'arte because they're such a perfect fit. They're an opportunity to wear a costume and a mask and be a little different than those two traditional sty styles. Carnavale, uh, Commedia dell'arte came in right around 1500 and it quickly rose to popularity because it was comedy. It made people laugh. Here you see three of their traditional characters. Harlequino, who's actually one of the later ones. Pantalone, who was the Venetian merchant, very pompous sort. And Pulcinella, who was a, a kind of a doofus, a musical doofus, if you will. So here we do. There you can see one of the Pantalones. Pantalone means uh, pants and he always wore red ones in this case complete with um, enhancements and I made a note for you if you want to kind of set your mind in time and space again Shakespeare wasn't born until 1564 he became active as an author playwright whatever in 15 about 1585 Meanwhile, Commedia dell'arte had started in the very early 1500s, so it'd been around probably about 75 years by the time Shakespeare entered 
stage right. And it had arrived in 66, two years after he was born. So the broad comedy, the slapstick, and that word slapstick actually comes from Comedia dell'arte, uh, was already there, ready and willing to take part in his place as well. So we have Il Dottore, this is not the plague doctor, a different kind, Pulcinella, Pantalone, and Arlecchino. And these were a standard set. The play might change. The actions were often ad lib, but the characters, everybody knew them. They knew who they were, how they would act, what the expectation was for each one of them. And they were bawdy, vulgar, uh, lots of sexual innuendo. This is actually from a painting from the 1600s of Carnavale and Commedia dell'arte activities. And notice here's a Punchinella sitting backwards on a mule. I think it's a mule, it's hard to tell, where he's being pushed along by a second one using a, um, I can't think of the word right now, uh, the fan for a fire. And this fellow is challenging the second one who looks like he seems to have lost his drawers somewhere. So it based its charm on free improv on the stage. This is an oil painting sketch. It may have been done by uh, Gaudi, maybe. Uh, but you've got one character behind the screen, which was just simply some curtains roughly held up on a platform that's above the crowd so that everyone could see the activity. Here's a Pulcinella, the white costume. And this, not sure. They often had extra characters that weren't the simple traditional ones. He may have been a zany. Here we have Harlequin and Scaramouche, Capitano Scaramouche, facing off on another platform stage with just the curtains in the background. It looks like a poster on one end in one of the piazzas, one of the plazas in Venice or in the resounding countryside because they didn't operate just in Venice. They trooped like little um, circuses almost from town to town throughout the countryside as well. Now here we have Il Dottore, who was a very pompous sort. And we'll talk more about each of the standard ones who became adaptations into Carnavale, starting with Dottor Valenzone or Il Dottore. And remember, this is not the pest pestilence doctor. He, this one is very pompous. He's usually said to be coming from Bologna, which was one of the university centers. So the hint was that he had his degree from that, you know, and he would wear a big black suit. He would have his shoulders back and a big belly coming out. He would have a uh, short black cap on kind of doctor or perhaps a professore. And he would have this big fat nose and a brow, but the rest of his cheeks were exposed as well as the rest of his face. So this was called a one third mask, which was the only one of its kind. So if you saw one, you recognized it. And quite often it had a mustache attached to it as well. So he's well fed and learned uh, If you are familiar with much of Italy, Bologna is considered one of the centers for good, heavy pasta food. They enjoy it there and it is wonderfully made and you can get just as large as Il Dottore if you aren't careful. And he would stroll around often with a book under one arm making pronouncements. Even if he didn't know anything about something, he would say he did. And he would tell you all that was going on. So, il dottore, dottor Balanzone, and he, often the uh, actor would rouge their cheeks because the impression was to be that he probably had a little bit too much to drink and maybe was a little bit tipsy along with being rather obnoxious, all of which the audience would eat up. They would love to laugh at il dottore. And here is one in modern day Venice. You can see him. Um, there we go. Um, 
standing with one of the other figures who might be a quasi Harlequino. He's got different colors on there at any rate. And he, so it just talks about how he moved and gestured and kind of bounced around the stage, always making the big pronouncements, the broad, expansive gestures. And then we get to Pantalone. Now, this is the second time I've done this particular lecture. And someone came up to me after the first time to tell me that when they saw this particular mask on the screen, they were so startled because it made them think of one from the Northwest Coast of Native American art. It resembled it so closely to their mind. And I have looked since and seen what they, what they meant. There is a similarity there, but this is in fact the traditional mask of Pantalone. And here's a side view with uh, extra feathers for the eyebrows and for the whiskers added. Uh, often they were black, but sometimes they were painted red. And Pantalone uh, may come from Pianta Leone or plant the lion because the Venetians in their trading, moving out, created quite an empire for themselves for about a thousand years. And they would plant their flag to indicate they had arrived and this was going to be their territory, if only for mercantile reasons, wherever they went. So that reference is kind of a cross reference to the fact that the character represents this business class, the merchants who were the backbone and the driving force of the wealth of the city and the Republic of Venice for a thousand years. They had the trade routes locked up. They had the galleys, not with slaves, by the way. The, the, the ships that sailed for Venice had paid oarsmen, sailors. At any rate, um, he would wear a black robe sometimes, have that red cap and the red outfit, because other versions of how he got his name is that he had pantaloons, pantaloons, or red pants. And here you can see in this painting capturing the effect that um, I seem to be scrawling all over the place with this laser. Sorry, I don't know what you're saying there. Uh, on top of what you first might think was a beast of burden, but look more closely, there are only two feet under the cloth and one person's head. So it is an actor bent over with just a cloth tossed over their back to represent it. And here we have a Harlequin, and here's a character similar to the uh, Pulcinella, but probably not that. And he seems to be bemoaning his fate in a grouchy manner. And he was always the victim of somebody because he was an easy mark since he was just so full of himself. And the only female character that had any traditional and ongoing role was Columbina. And she was a servant girl. Here we see, and this is a modern performance of Commedia dell'arte with the traditional characters. We see Il Dottore and Pantalone interacting. And it looks like Il Dottore has made his point and Pantalone is objecting strenuously. And then we get to the trickster, Arlecchino, also known as Harlequin. Now he's got a little more than a half mask. What you see on this photograph is actually a strap that's not part of the mask. And he is, the actor uses their face, their mouth and their jaw to help illuminate the feelings that they're projecting with their character. He's supposed to be silly and maybe stupid, but maybe not because he does sly, slickery things all the time. And he's always hungry. He's always um, flibberty gibbert. And he's very acrobatic. So here you can see a good example of how the uh, actor adds to the face. Notice the bump up on the forehead. You remember I pointed that out during the mask making figure that uh, the Harlequino mask has the cat-like eyes, bulbous nose and cheeks, 
and then a bump on the forehead. It's just simply the tradition of that mask. And here you see the Arlecchino performing. I would guess that the original Arlecchino was literally made of patches sewn onto the clothing of different colors of whatever, like a patchwork quilt. But over time, it became much more stylized. And this is again a modern Harlequino in expressions in his body to show you he's thinking, he's talking, he's projecting his thoughts. I love this description I added here came from a description of Commedia dell'arte figures. And they mentioned that he's so lost in thought sometimes or losing track of things that he can be sitting in a chair and looking around, where is the chair? Other times he'll be pretending to be someone else and the audience can see his costume underneath another costume. So they know it's really Arlecchino. It's not Il Dottore, even though he's dressed super Il Dottore in Il Dottore's mask on top of his own with the tricorn hat and the doctor's robes. And he's gesturing as if he's lecturing. And he makes broad gestures. He's always up for something. And he's often carrying a stick that he slaps things with as he's talking to them. It, they mentioned that it was also used to stir polenta. If you're familiar with the Italian diet, polenta is a corn pone kind of mixture stirred over the fire to thicken, like kind of like an oatmeal. Uh, but that same wooden spatula that perhaps originally came from the kitchen would whack whoever or whatever. If he was talking about something, he'd whack on that. If he's talking about something else, he'd gesture. And then he'd slap someone on the back of the head with it. And it became known as the slap stick. And the comedy became known as the slap stick comedy, which you may have heard of even if you hadn't been familiar with Commedia dell'arte. So here we capture him in the middle of his performance. Clearly he has the center of attention for the other actors. But the style of the costume became so popular, mainly I think because of the possibilities with a multicolored outfit that it has translated from a more traditional look in past times to an ornamental look in recent years. And then we get to Pulcinella. You remember Pulcinella was the fellow who had several pictures all to himself by Tiepolo, one of the artists we looked at. This is the mask typical for the Pulcinella. Notice it has a kind of a long beak, not as long as the Dottore del Pesta, but long. He's always hungry. He's often depicted eating, and when he's not eating, he's playing a musical instrument, dancing around, falling around, flopping around, always in a white costume of, with some sort of a pointed hat. Sometimes the mask is more prominent with the nose than others, and he's crazy and lazy, they say about him. Here you can see him interacting with a harlequin and here with some musical instruments. His squeaky voice, big nose, silly character, and it became very identifiable. You always knew a Pulcinello by the tall white hat, the white costume, often very floppy. And you'll see him, these are all modern Pulcinellas, some from Comedia dell'arte, others probably from Carnivale. And here you see a Carnivale figurine like a large uh, float in the piazza being celebrated because it's an easy costume, white, and it shows easily and the black mask is small, yet you can blot with that simple image. And then we get to our little lady and that is Columbina. Now, sometimes she is also called Arlequina. So Columbina or Arlequina. When she's called Arlequina, she's often dressed as a female version of Harlequin or Harlequino. And here you see her with her bow, Harlequino. 
And here you just see someone in a very elaborate version of the costume. But her traditional garb in Commedia dell'arte was as a serving girl with a flounced skirt, apron, and some kind of jacket. Red, blues, and whites were the traditional colors, although they varied. And in these two, in these two scenes, I have to remember not to point with my finger because you can't see that. She's making fun of people, often to the detriment of one of the other actors. And when you see her in crowds at Carnivale, she's often the only female present among a group of male Carnivale figures. Lakina, and here as Colbina. And then we get to one of the perhaps a little more minor characters, but very flashy and well known, Il Capitano. At one time, Northern Italy was held in possession of Spain, and the Spanish sent their own troops. And so the Spanish soldier leader became another figure for mockery in a way. And he is the captain, the Spanish captain. And he has many names, but the, here I'm just telling you he's called Il Capitano or sometimes Capitano Scaramouche. And he is often the figure of fun. He will be trying to get to the princess in the play and be disregarded or disrespected by Harlequin or tricked if they're both competing for Columbina. And here are some other depictions of his outfit. You can see that there, it's not indelibly one style, but there is a similarity in all of them. So you very quickly recognize the fellow with the feather in his cap, the ruffled neck, the yellow and orange stripes or yellow and red, or even in this case, blue and yellow, the stripes and the soldierly manner, a big sword or a long cane. That's the soldier. He may have the big boots we saw in the previous image, or he may just have very fancy shoes. But whatever his outfit, he's telling tales of his own bravery. He's very good at telling how great he is until something dangerous happens, at which point he's gone. So we enter Carnivale in Venezia in the 21st century. Here's a typical mask shop with a mask maker at work as he sells his wares. And to enjoy the images I'm going to show you of modern Carnivale, I thought I would give you a short story biography of an actual historical figure who even today is well known by his name, Casa Nova. Casa Nova, lover of women. His actual name was Giacometto Casanova. He was born in 1725, died in 1798. So he's 1700s. This is a painting of him by Alessandro Longhi, Pietro Longhi's son. We saw a lot of Pietro Longhi's paintings earlier. And he loved Carnivale, he loved Venice. He was a Venetian at heart. He was born in Venice and he started life there and wearing a mask, wearing the Bauta outfit was very much his style. But he was known as the womanizer and also a gambler. However, by his own written words, he was also a scam artist, scufflaw, alchemist, spy, and believe it or not, a church cleric. He wrote satires, fought duels, got out of prison many times, including across the Bridge of Sighs, which I mentioned to you earlier. I hope you're enjoying these photographs from modern Venice Carnivale as we go along. And he was very, very smart. He entered the University of Padova at the age of 12. Bologna and Padova each had a big university and both cities were very close to Venice. Bologna is a little south. Padova is just along the Brenta, uh, one of the rivers 
from uh, Venice itself. And both are still existing to study um, medicine and went to Bologna to study law, although they also have other things there. But he discovered at a very early age the two things that made him the man he was, his love of all women and his love of gambling, which he was not very good at. So he was constantly losing money and he was constantly playing around with any woman who would have him. Uh, whether it was one or two in his bed didn't matter. Who they were didn't matter as long as they were of the female persuasion. So for a little, little while after he graduated from the university at a very young age, he became a church cleric. Didn't last long. Had lots of gambling debts. He ended up in prison, tried the church again, finally decided to try something different and declared himself a soldier. Now, this is a quote. He wrote his own memoirs at the end of his life, which became very famous and well-read by a lot of people later. But he wrote this. I bought a long sword and with my handsome cane in hand, a trim hat with a black cockade and with my hair cut side whiskers and a long false pigtail, I set forth to impress the whole city. He had a way with words, but he quickly discovered that being a soldier was kind of boring, at least when you're not at war. And so he quit. He was now 21 years old and he'd already done all these things. He was uh, visiting in Paris, in, um, in Spain, in Germany. He tried the different cities in Italy. He was invited into houses because he had such a smooth persona. He was very friendly. Everybody liked him. He escaped from one place, went to the next. He'd fall in love, have his heart broken, and then go on to the next lady and seduced dozens of women. And as it says here, he became a Freemason, wrote a play, and finally returned to Venice, where he had more affairs with every lady he could catch, whether they were married or not, virgins or not, or even pledged as nuns to the church. By the time he was 30, Venice Tribunal, which is the uh, governing body, had him arrested for all of these outrages. And this is when he was taken across the Bridge of Sighs to the stone prison across from the Ducal Palace and sentenced to be there for five years. Escape was impossible for most people at any rate. He planned an escape when one of his patrons who had been um, asking for assistance from the tribunal, finally got them to agree to move him to a bigger cell. So it was a little bit nicer. So his, his plan went out the window and he didn't. It was time for a new plan. And now I'm gonna stop for a minute on Casanova just to mention this particular photograph because in the two circles, if you look closely, are horses. These are the Cavalli di San Marco. They were, probably made in Greece around the turn of the millennium from somewhere between 280 and or 280 and 200 BC, late golden age of the Greek sculptures. And it was four in hand. They were for a chariot and they were at an equestrian location in Constantinople, which was the center of the Roman Empire during the time of the Crusades, after Rome had fallen to the Visigoths and Vandals. And Venice was among the many groups that sent knights and soldiers to fight in the Crusades. But the Venetian group has more of a reputation for looting than they did for fighting. And in fact, brought back these four horses to Venice during the Crusades, having looted them from the Christian city of Constantinople, which was Christian at that time. 
it was supposed to be the jumping off place towards Pat that far, found some things they liked, filled up their galleys and headed home. But the horses wouldn't fit. They had to cut off their heads, stuff them into the galleys. When they got them back, put the heads back on and to cover the place where they had taken them apart, they added horse collars. The ones that are now in front of the cathedral are copies. The originals are inside the cathedral in a special museum just for them. So that's an aside just because. So here we go, Casanova's daring escape from behind the Ducal Palace across the Bridge of Sighs. Above him in the next layer of cells was a priest also imprisoned. And the two of them were allowed to exchange books, both being uh, learned people. And he wrote a note in one of them telling the priest that he wanted to escape and he needed the priest's help. And if the priest would dig down from above, they could meet up and Casanova would help them get out. The priest agreed. Meanwhile, Casanova passed to the priest a spike he had made out of a piece of metal he had found. And he hid it under a Bible, under a big plate of pasta. And when I read that, I knew I had to end that for you because where else but in Italy would you hide something like a file to get out of jail under a bowl of pasta? I love it. So new prisoner is then added to Casanova's cell just when the priest and Casanova are getting ready to get out. What did the new prisoner have? He was a spy and Casanova quickly realized that, a spy for the tribunal to see what Casanova was up to. So he was also a very, very firm Christian, very faithful, extreme almost. So Casanova being furbo, which is an Italian dialect word for sneaky, uh, says to him, I've had a dream. And in this dream, an angel comes down from heaven to save me, to get me out of this jail cell. And the prisoner believes him. So when they hear scratching noises overhead, Casanova says, the angel is coming. And the other fellow drops to his knees in prayer. Meanwhile, the priest drops to the floor from above and Casanova and the priest knock out the spy and flee out the door somehow. Not sure how they got that part done. And then they walk across the Bridge of Sighs, break out into one of the corridors in the Palazzo and stroll out arm in arm from the Ducal Palace where they get on a gondola at sunrise and escape. Casanova wrote all this down. So it's not just it's probably what he made up but it's what he wrote. Ended this episode by saying, thus did God provide me with what I needed for an escape, which was to be a wonder, if not a miracle, I admit that I'm proud of it. He was proud of a lot of things he did that were very edgy. So among his scams, he was an alchemist. He went to Paris. He told all the rich people there that he was 300 years old and he could create diamonds out of dust. He also uh, managed to convince a count there that he would be a great spy because he could say just about anything with a straight face and make people believe it. In 1760, without a penny to his name, back in Paris he went and he said he was a knight, a penniless knight, and that if she gave him enough money, he could make her into a young man using magic. He also dabbled in politics. He managed to get himself into the court of King George in England, met with Catherine the Great in Russia, and even dueled a colonel over an Italian actor, actress in Warsaw. So he got around the continent. In his autobiography, Story of My Life, which he wrote in his final years, he talked about, it was a real tell-all kind of thing. And he talked about all the royalty, the popes, the cardinals, and others that he met in his time. And it became a fascinating document for historians because he mentions people like Voltaire, Goethe, and Mozart among his circle of acquaintances. So after 
exile. He's returning to Venice. And after nine years in a vicious satire play of the nobility where they kick him out again. So he becomes a librarian to another count. He was so tired there, so lonely and bored. He thought about committing suicide. And then he thought, well, what? I'm in a place with books. I'll write my own. And he wrote his memoirs. Meanwhile, Bonaparte shows up at the doors of Venice, conquers Venice, takes it over, and Napoleon Bonaparte shuts down Carnivale and the wearing of masks, so integral to so many of Casanova's plots. This was in 1797. Casanova dies the next year. He was only 73 years old, which perhaps at that time was elderly, but you have to think he may have had a broken heart. Now, if you get to Venice, whether it's for Carnivale or not, you simply must go to the Piazza San Marco to visit the Ducal Palace, to visit the cathedral, just to see the ambience, but also to visit Cafe Florian. Interestingly enough, it will be exactly 300 years old this Christmas. And it is a gathering place at Carnivale time for folks in their costumes and finery. And you can see the name Florian right here. It has a number of different labels for itself. Sometimes it's bar, sometimes it's cafe, sometimes it's tea room, depending on where you're looking. This is an artist depiction showing ghosts of Carnivale revelers past sitting in Florian's looking out at modern day tourists walking by in the piazza. So on the 29th of December, four days after Christmas, in 1720, we're in 2020, remember, the owner, Floriano Francesconi, opened this cafe. He called it Triumphant Venice, but everyone just said, let's go to Florian's place. And eventually, the name actually became simply Cafe Florian. Now the arcades out in front, this is all inlaid marble, if you get it and walk on it, and with little settees and, and very fancy little tables and chairs right along the front of the cafe. Further out into the piazza, the seats are a little less fancy, but also served by the waiters of the cafe. But posing at the cafe, here it says, you can see the tea room label of it there and the cafe label of it there for Florian's, is almost de rigueur for anyone who is taking part in Carnivale. These people are all posed inside That's the interior, taking tea and maybe spumante or white wine. And the, you can see it beautifully paneled. Remember it was 1720. So that was the style of the time and it has never been changed. Uh, brocaded, velveteen, seating, marble and inlaid woods, beautiful service trays, real silver. Uh, and then the array of people in full costume. It is a very special experience if you can get there to Florian's during Carnivale. And here you can see crowded at the windows of Florian's looking in at some of the costumers. Uh, you only can get in there if there's a seat available. So you could be waiting outside for a while. And I'm sure during Carnivale, the ones in costume get priority seating because it's a great attraction for bringing customers in. You love these costumes, so elaborate and clearly well enjoyed by the people wearing them. I especially liked this fellow with the sailing ship on his wig. And here we've got steampunk. And this I added to the poster for Venetian Carnivale, but it's for Lake Meridian, Merritt, sorry, Lake Merritt in California. Here are the outside seating outside of the cafe and there's a, a whole long line of cafes under the arcades 
at the big piazza. You'll find them throughout Venice, throughout all of Italy. But the large number of tables allows the peoples in the costumes to put themselves on display. But the ones who want to really get an opportunity to show themselves off will often stand in front of the gondolas along the quay. And you can see them here. So go to Carnivale in Venice sometime and perhaps you'll meet a Casanova just for you. Or maybe not. And so Carnivale ends as Ash Wednesday begins. And that's the end of our talk. And just to let you know a little bit more about Ollie, we welcome new members and volunteer instructors. And you can learn more about Ollie at Ollie at wvu.org. And I hope you go there and visit and find out all the classes that are available to you, even during quarantine, because we do Zoom lectures as well as uh, other forms of information for you. So, and now I'm going to wait because Maria is going to join me, I believe, with some, perhaps some questions from the end of this presentation. Maria? Yes. So we're, we'll give some time to the, the people that are, are watching with us this evening to type in their questions in the comments section on, on YouTube. And I've got my eye on that. So everyone okay. watching, please feel free to, to put that in. Um, but I do have a, a couple of, of pre-prepared questions for you, uh, Mel, if you don't mind me asking while we wait for, for a couple. That sounds good. To chime in. Um, so uh, just most recently, you were talking about Casanova. You mentioned uh, a patron, and uh, I assume that with all of his gambling debts, he must have, have had several. Is that the case? Well, uh, patronage and gambling are actually the antipathy of each other because a patron would give him money. And if he did, it would quickly go out the gambling door. As we saw in those earlier paintings of the Ridotto, the gambling halls in Venice, gambling was big. It's one of the reasons why I suspect they named uh, the gambling hall here in Charleston, Mardi Gras Casino for the very reason that Mardi Gras and celebration of Carnivale seem to go hand in hand with gambling. And certainly Casanova loved to gamble and often ended up penniless, which is why he would need a patron, someone who would pay his way and support him for a while until he had enough in his pocketbook to go off on his own, gamble and womanize once again. So, but the patrons were often the victims of his scams, his um, pretenses, whether he was pretending to be 300 years old or simply an occultist or alchemist. So different Very affairs, different ways of looking at things for our friend Casanova. Right, but always apparently looking for a cash flow. <laughs> and a good time. Yeah. Yes, it's definitely a good time. That was the that was the number one thing in Casanova's life. The main driver. Yes. <laughs> um, so how many times have you yourself been to Carnivale? Oh, gosh. Um, you know, I'm not even certain I could tell you. <laughs> uh, but since I lived for a long time, less than 30 miles away from Venice, and could drive into the city because of that little causeway that I showed you early on, mm -hmm. you can drive in and park and then take the, the water bus from there or take the various water taxis, uh, made it easy. But I did not go during the height of each of the celebrations because the crowds are just simply, you feel like you're a sardine and there's nowhere to go because you have either water or walls, and they're stone walls usually. So uh, those people, braver or um, more comfortable with crowds, would go at those times. I went in the early morning often when there would be mist, the seagulls, pigeons, lots <laughs> and lots of pigeons, and just a few wanderers plus the early risers in their costumes. And it was actually the most magical then. So going at those times, I found for me personally, the most fun. 
the imagery that you just painted sounds tremendous. I would love to be standing oh. in, the, in that piazza with, with the and men overlooking. It's winter time, mm -hmm. which for those people who know Venice know that it's probably the best time of year to go because in the summertime, the canals smell really bad. Uh, very strong odors, but from say October until late spring, it can be lovely. In fact, um, one time while I was in Venice, not for Carnivale per se, but to visit an art museum there that was founded by an American woman named Peggy Guggenheim, which has a uh, water bus stop very close by, a Vaporetto stop. I was in the museum and I came out into the little courtyard and lo and behold, it was snowing. It was the one and only time I ever saw snow in Venice. And it came down in those big fat white flakes and built up to two to three inches within an hour. Got on the Vaporetto. And when you're, a Vaporetto is the, like a long bus in the water with seats on both sides with windows. And when you're in and the little balconies on the front and back where you can sit so you're out of doors, riding down the canal, the Grand Canal in Venice in a snowstorm is the most incredible experience, so silent. Mm -hmm. And of course, no motors to speak of. And the Vaporetto has an engine, but it's, you hear the lapping water and the crying of the gulls overhead just magical oh. uh, it's one of those places if you've never been you really need to go before it sinks into the sea which may <laughs> happen soon that's indeed that sounds magical so, if there are questions that's great but if there aren't any questions folks can always contact you and later and pass it on to me if necessary absolutely so uh we another class Yes. So if, if someone is interested in learning, uh, learning more uh, about Carnivale or Commedia dell'arte, do you have any resources that you, you would be able to share with the people watching, like any books that you would suggest they read? Or... Well, unfortunately, at this moment in time, I'm not prepared for that. I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't think to have a list handy for that purpose, which I normally do for one of my classes for the Ollie. But since this was for a wider audience, then I didn't think of this audience as being students per se. Mm -hmm. I didn't prepare that. However, I will say this. Google is incredible. You type in Carnivale or even Carnival and Venice mm -hmm. and choose either videos, which will get you YouTubes with all sorts of lectures or just observations of the passing scene, or you go to the um, images, which is where I fished out a lot of the photographs I used in this of modern day um, Venice, or you type in Republica as well, and you'll get the older Venice and you can go to all and get all kinds of lecture information. You can get resources, research papers even. Uh, there are a variety of universities that have published books about Venice at Carnivale and uh, Michelin guides. If you go to like Books a Million or a library and you get the travel guides, Michelin guides are especially good. There's also one called the Blue Guide to Northern Italy that's very good on giving you detailed information about all the places you can visit, the hours of operation and the kinds of artwork you can see in them. Uh, you cannot visit Italy without falling over museums everywhere you go. When I left Italy, it was quite the withdrawal to come to cities that don't have 17 museums and 3,000 different places to visit that are art related was a withdrawal for a while. Mm -hmm. I go to Washington DC once in a while just for the National Gallery now because it's so gorgeous there. They, that gives me my impetus. But getting back to resources, I'm trying to think. Um, Gore Vidal, I'm looking up at my bookshelf in front of me, has written a book called Vidal in Venice, which is wonderful for anyone wants to see something like that. There's one called Venice, the Lion City, which is a fairly recent publication. Um, 
Oh, let's see. I'm looking and I'm seeing Medici, but they're not really from Venice. They're more Florence. Those are the two that come to my mind and that I see right off the top of my head. Uh, you can get specialty items like on the uh, Basilica di San Marco, which would be about the church, the cathedral itself, which is an incredible collection of art and mosaics. The mosaics in that cathedral are breathtaking. And unfortunately, water is lapping at the edges of it quite a lot these days. When I first went to Venice, the very first time I went as a student, I was studying Gothic art and my professor wanted us to look at the facade, the front of the cathedral, the Duomo di San Marco. And it was at Agua Alta, which means high water. And once in a while today in the newspapers, you'll see photographs of Aqua Alta because it's becoming very prevalent, sadly, uh, with the rising waters worldwide of the ocean level. And so very standard in Venice, they have these things that look like sawhorses and big wooden planks. And we're talking thick, long wooden planks, probably about 12 to 16 inches wide. And they will put these planks on the sawhorses and everyone's expected to walk the plank around the piazza unless you want to wade in the water. And our professor had wading boots on and stood in front of the cathedral because it was at Aqua Alta and there were about 17 of us standing on these planks with everybody walking behind us. So we're bumping up like this watching the professor who's talking and pointing up at the cathedral while we're like birds on a wire with the water underneath. I get motion sick and here's the water from the tides moving in and out beneath our feet. That's an experience as you can tell, I'll never forget. <laughs> but if you're looking for books, uh, check for books about the cathedral at San Marco or St. Mark's in English, St. Mark's and you will get lots of information about their mosaics, about their history, about their architecture, which is quite unique with the multi-domes and uh, their paintings, just gorgeous stuff and centuries old. This is very, very old. So that's some resources available to people who are interested. And of course on the Commedia dell'arte side, Stop me when you have to, Maria. No, <laughs> you're not on for a long time. Uh, on the Comedia dell'arte side, look at anything for theater, for early history of the theater, for history of comedy in the theater, for slapstick comedy, or for the history of Italian comedy. Because Comedia dell'arte might be um, a moniker that you don't feel familiar or comfortable with, but those other things will get you there. Or if you had a favorite character, just the history of Harlequin himself is enough to take you a lot of interesting places and see things. So hopefully that will give folks some doors to open if they're really curious. Absolutely. Um, so just out of your, your personal preference, do you have a favorite character or a favorite mask? out of the ones that you discussed today? I'm a bit of a traditionalist, quite honestly. The Bauta, I love. Mm -hmm. There's something, as it, you know, they talk about it as being a ghost faced. And as I uh, alluded to and what I wrote, wrote, what I wrote in the presentation, what I've said, when you're on those long, narrow canals or on the back alleyways, and you come across someone walking towards you in one of those costumes, mm -hmm. it really transports you to another time and place. And of course, with my background in art history, it takes me to the time when the artists were living the experience in the 16, 1700s and painting their, their images on their um, paintings uh, of... Uh, the Bauta in his tricorn hat, he or she, uh, the white mask and the little mantle that he wore. Incredibly um, time machine-like in its image. 
Uh, speaking of those narrow back alleys, you can easily get lost in Venice. If you go on the waterways, someone else is taking you, you're okay. But if you're walking, someone somewhere along the line, and I saw these as early as the 1970s, uh, so they've been at least 50 years done this way, in red paint with a brush has got S, M, and an arrow starting at the train station, or F, S, and an arrow starting at St. Mark's, and you follow all the bends and turns and alleyways, just follow those, it's like the yellow brick road, it will take you either to the train station in one direction, F, S, or to St. Mark's, S, M, in the other. And they've been there the whole time. When I left Italy in 2004, those same little graffiti-like images. I've never seen Venice formalize directions to help tourists out. They just don't. But somebody with a paintbrush and red paint has helped you out. So Venice is full of quirky stuff. <laughs> and you can have fun being there, whether it's at Carnivale or not. I love that you I, as if we weren't sold already I think you've you've definitely done so oh, and it will always be in my heart <laughs> um well I think you you answered this last question with with your previous one just based on on your response of being more of a, a traditionalist as far as the the masks that you prefer but because we did see where uh when Carnivale was was brought back in the the 1970s that people still into this day, will make traditional masks more ornate. Do you do you prefer truly the classics, like the plain white Bauta mask, or would you um, would you prefer something that has a little bit more decoration, like the gilding or or applique? Well, I will, I will tell you this: um, if I didn't have it in another room, I would show you my favorite one right now. But it's quite <laughs> a distance away from here. If you go into an artisan's mask shop in Venice, they'll have the masks hanging so they don't touch each other. And a few on display in the window and along the walls. They will not be crammed together overlapping each other. When you get there, be warned. They may not be original to Venice. But when you see these traditionally made, whether they're the fancy new versions with gorgeous arrays of color and style and added bells and feathers and things or the very simple versions. They are just so stunning, whether simple or fancy, that it takes your heart away. And my personal possession, which was purchased in uh, 2003, just before I left, cost me over $100 and today would probably run closer to five hundred dollars wow. and it's a paper mache made mask just in the manner that i showed during the presentation but it's in untraditional colors blues and grays and silvers which are very unusual for a carnivale mask in venice which is what drew me to it and it's the full face rather in the style of the Pierrot masks, but not too broken up on the surface of the face and with an array of uh, curls, almost like a jester's or joker's mask from a deck of cards with a little bell on the end of each one. And they're carefully arranged. I think it's probably a version of cardboard with a stiffening agent maybe even starch and then lined with fabric. So it's very fragile. And it comes with a wooden stick that you hold. So you, you don't actually put it, attach it to your head, you hold it in front of your face. And I just love that. So that's certainly the opposite of the Bauta that I just told you was my traditional favorite. So I go both ways. <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> Well, thank you very much for your time, Mel. That's You're those welcome. are all of the questions that we have. Um, I really uh, appreciate, and on behalf of everyone at Festival, thank you for your time. Uh, thank the team at Ollie for for letting this partnership happen this year, and uh, cannot cannot thank you enough for for your time and how 
tremendous this has been and how much I've learned uh, from I'm you. I'm good. I'm glad. So I'm, I'm sure the audience has as well. And I encourage you all to check out Ollie at the website here so you can continue uh, continue your learning through Absolutely. all of the different uh, Absolutely. that they have. And Oops. Uh, if you are Thank interested, you. there are five more days of festival for you to enjoy. You can find all of the events at festivalcharleston.com. And uh, thank you all again for joining us. Mel, is there anything you'd like to say as we sign off? Only salute Maria. Well done, brava, brava. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Mel. And thank you all for joining us. All right.